Hello to our viewers and a good afternoon or evening or morning, wherever you are. A very warm welcome to this 16th episode of the EADI webinar series. To all 12 participants by now, I'm Doris Obrecht. I'm happy to be the new host of this series. I'm talking to you from near Vienna in Austria. EADI, which is running this webinar series, um, EADI is the European Association of Development Research and Training Institutes. And this webinar series runs already since 2017. The focus is on engaging with researchers, practitioners, and all persons who are interested in thinking outside of the box a little bit when it comes to development issues. We want to encourage our colleagues from all region, regions around the world to take part as speakers and as viewers as you do right now. Topic and title of this webinar today is Rethinking Research Collaboration for Global Development. I would like to introduce to you um, two very experienced speakers in this field, Dr. Jude Franzman and Dr. Kate Newman. They are co-conveners of the initiative Rethinking Research Collaborative. This is an international network of academics, organizations from different contexts who are all dealing with development issues in one form or another. But before we will, hi, <laughs> they're here now. Before we will dive into our topic, I will give you some technical information on this um, webinar format and also the schedule for today. Right after this introduction, we will hear Jude and Kate. The presentation will take about 20 minutes. After that, I have some questions and then we will have plenty of time for discussion and debate with you. Everyone not speaking will be automatically muted, so we avoid the background noises. If you want to speak, you can easily unmute yourself in the bottom left corner of your screen. There you can also switch on your camera if you want to be seen during, the, during your comment or your question. And I would also like to ask you to um, switch on the chat box at the bottom of your page and use it to indicate if you want to say something or whenever you want to join the discussion. If you don't want to see the screens of the other participants, I can't switch that off for you, then I recommend you click on the three dots on one of these screens where a name is written and just choose hide non-video participants. Um, I take the liberty to switch off your cameras during presentation, but only during the presentation. In the top right corner of your screen, you should see um, speaker view or gallery view. There you can change your own screen if you need to. And if your status bar at the bottom disappears, then just um, move the cursor to the bottom of the screen to make it reappear. I want to point out as well that this um, webinar will be recorded and uploaded at the ARD web page afterwards and at the YouTube channel. So if you feel uncomfortable with that, just please keep your camera switched off. Okay, that's it with the technical details. Let's come to the more interesting part. <laughs> In the last webinar with Henning Melba, there was one viewer who proposed that if academics, universities and other institutions are serious about a change, in development, they will have to make changes to enable and facilitate new conversations. And I'm very happy that our speaker's work is focusing on these new conversations and new collaborations. Jude Franzman and Kate Newman will talk about the work on understanding and improving transnational, sectoral and disciplinary research collaborations. And I anticipate this has a lot to do with new with opening up to new conversations. Yeah, they are <laughs> nodding their head. A few words about the two speakers. Jude Franzman is a social scientist from the Open University in UK. She has a rather interdisciplinary background spanning international development, education and science and technology studies. And Kate Newman, she's a practitioner and researcher. She has worked in the international development sector for quite a while now. Since 2016, she's co-head of the Center for Excellence in Research, Evidence and Learning at Christian Aid in the UK. Kate, Jude, thank you very much for your time today. And the floor is yours. You can unmute yourself at the left. 
Thank you for the introduction, Doris, and thanks everybody for joining us today in the seminar. Um, we, we're going to start with a presentation to contextualize some of the work that we've been conducting through the Rethinking Research Collaborative, but we're going to keep it very informal and conversational because central to this work is our relationships between the two of us and uh, the broader network as well. So we'll use the, the presentation as a basis to raise some issues to kind of show how our thinking has evolved over the last five years. And then hopefully this will lead to um, various questions via Doris and a stimulating conversation with everybody here. Uh, so, great. so I'm gonna share the screen. So hopefully that will work and will disappear. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> oh look, we're still there. Okay. No, Sorry, we're just working out the technology. <laughs> um, and I don't know how to move So it. I think we should be able to oh. Oh, that's strange. Sorry, we're just trying to work out how we move the slides forward. Your slide next. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So all right. So we're going to start by um, talking about this relatively recent drive to research collaboration and particularly large scale international, interdisciplinary and cross sectoral collaboration, which has become very fashionable with uh, funders and policymakers, as well as uh, researchers, whether from universities or practitioners. So um, we're going to yeah, start by talking about our own incentives and motivations for collaborating. Yeah, so Christian Aid is a big international NGO. We work in about 30 different countries around the world, um, doing a whole range of programmes that are contributing to achieving social justice and reducing poverty in different ways. And in those programmes, um, we're directly implementing work or we're um, doing work which is trying to encourage others like the government to implement work and there's always been a strong need to learn through, through that work and an importance in, in understanding both the effectiveness of the programs and the impact they're having but also to try and improve that or to share learning across with other development actors. So in the last few years generally for Christian Aid but also for other international NGOs there's been greater and greater emphasis on evidence and getting good quality evidence both for learning as I said but also for accountability or for policy and advocacy and influencing work trying to get government to take on programs. Christian Aid in 2016 decided to invest in a practitioner research centre and we set that up and we felt that um, that we do that a lot of the evidence work maybe wasn't that systematic and it would be good to bring a more researchy angle to it um, but that as practitioners we engage in development work in different ways in different spaces and have a lot of knowledge and networks and relationships and understanding that we could contribute into sort of defining what sort of research should be done that could be useful for development impact um, the center was designed to sort of strengthen Christian Aid's ability to do research, but also to try and engage in the sector to shape or influence how research is done by others. And at the same time as we were having these discussions internally in Christian Aid, I'd been working with Jude, we'd been thinking about the politics of evidence and in international development, and thinking more broadly about research collaboration. And um, so there was a sort of, there's been an evolution, if you like, in the relationship. And for Christian Aid to be part of the Rethinking Research Collaborative, it's been very much about both opening up opportunities for us to have different types of relationships with different types of researchers, whether they're in the global north or the global south through our programme work, but also to influence some of the ways that those research relationships happen. And as we'll talk later today, thinking more about fairness and equity mm -hmm. in those relationships and more about how, those, how the research itself can be impactful. In different ways on poverty. Yeah. And from an academic perspective, I think the literature is full of examples showing that it's in the interest of academics to collaborate with practitioners in order to access 
data to access um, research populations to have generate more impactful research by working with practitioners to translate research findings. But for me, I think um, a huge benefit is actually using collaboration as the means of improving academic theory, of bringing in practitioner knowledge, knowledge from different types of research stakeholder, whether academic uh, researcher in the global south or civil society, um, activists, social movements, larger NGOs or uh, research brokers more, more globally. Um, having this perspective, even for the benefit of academic theory, allows us to probe um, the way that we traditionally do things within disciplines and um, our, our institutions and our academic networks. So um, from a theoretical perspective, thinking about collaboration, joining together conversations and integrating different voices has, has been a huge um, benefit for um, myself and, and my academic colleagues. Um, and I think the third thing that we wanted to talk a little bit about was um, was the funding and policy incentives for, for research collaboration. And, and in the Rethinking Research Collaborative, we're coming at this largely, or at least a starting point due to the nature of our funding, was the UK context, which is quite specific and a little bit peculiar, let's say, especially given um, the turbulent current political climate, let's say. Um, <laughs> so, so um, we're really coming to it from this new emphasis on global challenge research, which goes hand in hand with a very um, significant unprecedented reprioritization of overseas development assistance funds into research, specifically the higher education sector. And this has changed the nature of what research is, um, challenging both um, traditional development actors as well as universities who don't necessarily have experience administering these types of development fund. So that's uh, um, both incentives for collaboration but also challenges to collaboration. At the same time we have the kind of socio-political climate of um, austerity um, uh, with heightened competition, scarce resources, the need to um, demonstrate measures of success for programs and um, for research publicly funded research alike. In the UK, we've got the Research Excellence Framework, um, which is, has an increasing focus on impact within that to show that the research funded by the public is actually making a difference. Um, and then at the same time, we have this ever, this, um, ever mounting recognition of the, the climate crisis, um, a push to work differently, both in the higher education sector and in the international development sector. Um, increasing attention to the potential of digital technology, which is sometimes seen as a magic bullet, even though there are um, problems as well around this. And then, of course, our uncertain um, political situation due to Brexit and a possible change in government, who knows at the moment. <laughs> um, so all of this creates a very particular set of incentives and also challenges around Collaboration. I think one thing that we would probably stress is the importance of acknowledging this context and that positioning, situating any partnership within these not only national but often um, multiple national and um, international contexts which intersect to make, um, to, to, to create different possibilities and constraints when you work together across a distance and with very different types of, of research actor. Um, so, oh, it's working. Now. So, um, where we've where we've come from, we um, we really came into this space. As many of you probably know, there was a um, a huge explosion of literature around research partnerships, and a lot of this was framed through a, a effectiveness agenda. So, it was uh, partnerships were seen in relation to specific research projects. And um, the idea was to try to work out how collaboration could be improved in order to make these projects more successful. So effectiveness being a sort of means to, um, a sort of monitoring evaluation mechanism to ensure that, um, that outcomes were, um, were achieved. But at the same time, there's been a, a move in rhetoric, which, um, 
is reflected in in funding and, and policy as well as in practice um, to to a, a more kind of equity focus fairness um, social justice agenda and and this um, it's certainly in the UK context UKRI the UK's um, main research or um, consolidated research councils have adopted this rhetoric in relation to their ODA funded research programs. Um, I think what we want to say here is that this rhetoric has three different underpinnings, different rationales. The first one is quite normative and it interacts with issues of, of social justice, knowledge, democracy, um, acknowledging that uh, knowledge is unequally distributed and represented around the world and um, seeking to redress this through more equitable approaches to both um, collaboration and knowledge production mobilization. The second links more to the effectiveness agenda and it's sort of seeing collaboration as a means to um, more um, effective or impactful research um, or to um, expanding disciplinary knowledge itself in a way that ultimately benefits either a project or a program or an institution or the sector in the case of higher education. And then the third um, rationale is statutory. So again, in line with um, ODA compliance, what does that mean for the, the way that funding can be spent, where it can be spent, um, and the, the, you can see this graph here, the UK um, investment in ODA for research has risen um, uh, very <laughs> noticeably in recent years. There's a, a more updated graph which shows that extending even further. Um, at the same time, there are accusations coming very close to um, um, accusing the, the UK of, of tied aid. Um, so, collaboration, genuine collaboration is, is a means to, um, to address this as well. Um, and, and onward, I, I thinking, I think beyond this, which we'll talk about this at the end of, of our presentation, looking forward to what um, this means as we start thinking about um, changing futures and how we can be more ecological in, um, in response to the climate crisis and other yeah, changes in the world. So um, from a sort of practitioner perspective, I guess we've um, had the experience of uh, with an increasing um, emphasis within the academic sector on real world research impact, sort of had the experience of academics coming to us as practitioners saying, you're closer to the community, can you work with us so that we can access community, could you, this is a research designed project, would you act as data collectors to to source the information or um, come come along to a, maybe a workshop where you can input your views into what we're doing and on the one hand that started getting NGOs like mine involved um, in working with researchers and as part of research projects and that's positive and also feeling like as a lot of our systems we collect lots of data maybe there are opportunities to analyze that data more and use it more but on the other hand, being concerned that we were seen just as data points rather than as people with stake in influencing what type of research is done and how that's done. Recognising that's both for a, an international NGO like mine, which works in many countries and has many connections and certain types of expertise, but maybe even more fundamentally for the community members and people living in poverty that we link to. How do their voices get heard and what's our responsibility as a civil society organisation who connects and works with those people to try and bring their perspectives in different ways that could influence what research is done and what meaningful impact looks like. And I think alongside this sort of move from effectiveness to equity and looking forward to ecological, we're also thinking about effectiveness and equity during a research process, but also what that might mean in terms of research impact and that type of research impact being very different for people that sit in different places. And this brings us nicely to, to our next slide, which is um, alongside this, this kind of evolution from effectiveness to equity, um, our thinking has shifted from this focus, quite narrow focus on partnerships, um, whether those are founded by um, 
a relationship between the two organizations or um, or a specific project to thinking more about systems and how um, collaboration happens not just in the implementation and um, design implementation and communication of research but it also happens in agenda setting for uh, research funding and governance who gets to um, to decide what gets researched and um, who evaluates that research and then obviously into use and impact as, as Kate just said um, and as well as this sort of these different domains that we've increasingly started to look at collaborative practice against we're thinking more about these kind of futures so not just how things are in the world today but how they are changing and how when we think about collaboration we need to bear in mind these changing contexts not just focus on what, what works in, in our current context um, do you wanna, no, oh, okay, <laughs> so yeah, so the Rethinking Research Collaborative, this is our, our website, please um, take a look. If you haven't already seen it, we're updating it um, over the next month. Um, we have, um, I guess our thinking has evolved through four projects. Um, we started, as Kate mentioned, with a, a seminar series, which allowed us to look at the politics, at evidence and the politics of participation, specifically in partnerships between international NGOs and, and universities. And this is where we started developing our, our thinking and frameworks. Um, we then looked at, um, um, at practitioner research, so research aside from um, outside of higher education institutions, um, in the international NGO sector and that allowed us again to look at very different ways of, of doing research, communicating research, understanding research. Um, we then evolved to look at more complex research collaborations which involve partners both from higher education, civil society um, and social movements across the global south as well as more internationally or UK focused um, organisations. And um, and we're now looking it through through the context of another project, looking um, at collaboration in big net networks and the use of data platforms to bring together multiple types of knowledge in order to respond to specific needs of marginalised groups in, in three countries. Um, and so a key output of, um, of all of this work it has been principles for fair and equitable research collaboration, which have been endorsed by UKRI, UK's main research funder, as well as IDRC and used in, um, in strategy and, for example, by the Independent Commission for Aid Impact in the UK to evaluate um, the ODA funded research programmes. So they really have been quite influential. Um, Kate's going to start by talking about the first of these. Yeah, so our, uh, our first principle was put poverty first. And um, that I mean, so just to go back a bit, we developed these principles through a sort of process of consulting with both civil society in the global south and academics in the global south, as well as civil society and academics in the global north, and talking through what it is that makes development research effective. Like, what 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 is the point of development research, and how should we be understanding it? And therefore, how does the process around development research need to be arranged? And what was key in those discussions was that if that development research is not relating to key issues and development challenges, if it's not taking its lead from the real experiences of people living in poverty and what their development ideas and pathways and aspirations are, then it's not going to have an impact. So the first starting point was to really understand what those, what the development needs are and to make sure that we're including different perspectives on those development needs to be able to design and think about what types of things we should be researching. That led on to a second principle which was, as Jude said earlier, the importance of context and that being a multiple complicated understanding of different contexts. So if we're working in partnership with academics based in the global north and academics based in the global south, they'll both be working in different contexts alongside maybe civil society practitioners who are working in uh, maybe the same cultural context as those academics, but maybe very different institutional contexts with different institutional priorities and needs and understanding. Mm -hmm. So how you bring together and understand these different contexts and really build from that to understand the types of impact that research could have. 
And linked to this, um, the third principle on redressing evidence hierarchies within these contexts, the different groups have different ways of understanding what knowledge is and different kind of knowledge priorities. So as well as actively um, recognizing the, this difference, we, um, uh, we agree that it's important to redress these hierarchies by giving prominence to the knowledges which aren't normally included in research spaces. Um, this means um, at its most basic, enabling um, academics from the global south to be principal researchers and ideally civil society organizations from the global south to be principal researchers too if the project is more appropriate to the practice space and um, so really looking at why the assumptions that we what, what the assumptions we make about leadership about um, privileging of certain knowledges does the, the research process and, and ultimate outputs um, aside from the recognition of diversity, another principle um, which is really important in the space, again responding to changing contexts and also changing projects, if you, as all of us who have worked with um, through collaboration know, <laughs> it's both um, a wonderful opportunity, but you have to be open to surprise and that things never turn out as, they, as, as you expect them to. Um, and this can be great, but it also need, requires like flexible ways of working adaptive um, ways of, of doing research which are often aren't compatible with particularly short-term grants. Um, do you want to say? Yeah, so in terms of respecting the diversity of knowledge of skills, um, we recognise that in any research collaboration there is a whole lot of different knowledge and skills that are needed. So there's obviously the ability to design a robust research process, whatever that looks like and whatever approach that that will look different depending on the type of research that's done but also if that research is to contribute to impact through the process then that involves different types of knowledge and skills and relationships and so thinking specifically about impact for example if your impact is understood in terms of um, how you influence or how you contribute original knowledge into the sort of the academic sphere of knowledge, then you might be thinking about how do you write well for a peer reviewed article in a journal or how do you write, how do you present well in a seminar like this one. If your impact is understood in terms of changing behaviour of people living in poverty or um, creating spaces so that they can imagine different futures, then, you're in, then your skills might be relational, they might be about where you're present, they might be about deep understanding of their context and their development trajectory building a collaborative together involves sort of mapping out both the type of process and the research questions that you have but also the types of knowledge and skills that are going to be necessary. Committing to transparency is much more around the internal processes of making a partnership operate well I suppose and what we found through the research was that often there might be transparency up to a certain point in developing the proposal and then maybe when a proposal was finalized and signed off the budget would have been cut in half and there wasn't a, a open process of negotiating how that budget was re was re-spread out or re-shared if you like or there might be quite a participatory process of doing the research and then it might end up in an academic article that has one author's name on and there wasn't a process of engagement around that all these sorts of things that don't happen deliberately, but a part of an operation of a partnership can really undermine the trust and the um, shared belief systems that go into the partnership. So having clear criteria and committing to transparency across the whole of the project, not just within the partnership, was really important. And then the final two, I mean, quite self-explanatory collaboration requires long-term relationships and critical reflection and appetite to keep learning and challenging ourselves and, and dealing with uncomfortable questions and uh, creating spaces to vent. Um, all of this is hard emotional work, so it's important to acknowledge that. Um, <laughs> So this, is, this slide is just showing some of the resource materials that we have developed to support collaboration. We won't talk through them now because I think we want to make time for conversation. Yeah, and, and so just to finish, I think, I mean, this is this given a sense of how our thinking has evolved um, and really where we are now. There are a number of kind of areas that, that we're taking off in different ways. One of them is, as we mentioned, is looking at these collaborative futures 
both um, to try and understand new um, ways of doing development, doing research, doing higher education in the context of, of the mounting climate context, uh, crisis, um, but we are also interested in rethinking um, impact capacity for um, research and ethics within the frameworks that we've just introduced. So we'll stop there and we um, hope that we've got enough time for some, some good conversation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kate. Thank you, Jude, so much for the praise presentation, which brought up a lot of thought, I would say. Before, I will give the floor first to me and then to the audience for the questions. Um, I have one for the audience as well, as we were talking about um, collaborations between researchers and practitioners and the role of the funding agencies, I would like to ask the, the participants um, from which field they come from. Are you a researcher? Are you a practitioner? Are you from a funding agency? Maybe, um, maybe, maybe you can type it in the chat function, just the word, are you a researcher? Are you a practitioner? So we know um, who is watching and and there is also, um, if you don't, okay, we have a researcher here. If you don't see the chat function, it's at the bottom of your um, screen in, this, in the toolbar, there you can switch it on. And also one um, person already stated a, a message because I had to leave early. You will also see it in the chat. It was um, stated for all, I think. Okay, um, I was talking to Jude before the webinar and she was asking me not to ask two critical question, <laughs> questions. <laughs> but I will start with a critical one because I know the field of international development and development research for quite a while now. And it lives from catchwords like impact, like participation, like collab uh, collaboration on eye level all and so on. How far are these concepts from you and these eight principles which you promote? How far are the, these feasible in real life or are they more rather about legitimacy towards ODA or funding agencies or the government? I think I'm unmuted. Yeah, thank you. That's a, a really, really important question. I think I'd like, I'll start and then Kate can um, follow up. Um, I think, first of all, that collaboration is absolutely a buzzword, whether it's um, collaboration, participation or co-production is a very popular one. Um, I think our approach to collaboration is that it is not a given good. You can do terrible collaboration. You can collaborate and either make no difference at all or disrupt existing structures and worsen um, people's lives. So I think our approach is a critical um, approach to collaboration. Um, at the same time, the principles that we've presented, we, I think when we decide, when we agreed to develop these principles, we um, agreed that principles by themselves don't make a difference. And that's why the, the um, resources that we shared briefly um, enabled us to look at how these principles might be translated into practice for a variety of different types of stakeholder groups. And we identified key six key groups. So I think academics in the UK, funders and policymakers in the UK, um, international NGOs based in the UK, um, research brokers and capacity providers, academics in the global south, um, civil society organizations and social movements in, in the global south. And we developed these modules which look at ways, first of all, provide some understanding of these different groups and then provide tools through which they might work to translate some of the principles into practice, acknowledging that there will be very different aims, objectives and ways of working for these different groups as well. So as well as being resources for these different groups, if you read all the resources, it gives you, we hope, an insight into how the other groups work as well and without understanding these different contexts, multiple contexts and cultures, it's very the principles themselves are completely insufficient and will always remain as buzzwords and at that level. I don't know if you want to add. Um, the only thing I wanted to add is the other thing that was important which we sort of mentioned earlier was to think about these principles across the whole 
of the research governance as well as the research practice itself. Um, so you can make a partnership work really well because you're both personally committed to it and you share a similar vision, but you're operating within the context of, um, as you said, lots of people using the same buzzwords with very many different meanings and that that context may or may not have opportunities to influence um, it. But that within any individual partnership, we should be keeping an eye on that context and look for ways that we can dynamically interact with it, if you like, and use the model experience of an individual partnership to try and influence that wider context and that's been really important throughout all the work we've been talking about. There is um, one thing most or nearly all the researchers I know are missing that is time. Most of them are under great time press pressure. Um, what system changes would it need that because all the things you stated and these principles, they all take time more than the research itself or the, the development work itself. Uh, what system changes would it need um, that these can also, um, that not only that, that, they, that they don't get not only the tools, but also the time to integrate them in, in their work? Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's a, a really good point and Kate and I would probably have very different reflections on our lack of time, <laughs> which is something we share, um, based on our different organisational um, obligations, I guess. Um, I think, I mean, I think one issue is that it is not just the time, but it's also the pace of this type of work and um, the partnerships that we've looked at, collaborations that we've looked at have very different um, paces what seems to be particularly successful are the ones which extend beyond projects so and are more like movements than partnerships, specific partnerships attached to um, a, a program or a project. And this allows for a kind of change of pace. So you might intensively collaborate together over a particular activity, and then there might be a lull when one individual might connect with another through a conference, a publication, something else, a new funding proposal, um, and then you pick up pace for another initiative and it kind of goes up. So, but this is only possible if you develop these strong networks which are sustained across these different types of activities and allow you to build on what you've done as opposed to forming new partners. Obviously, they, they, ideally, it's not the same per people. You integrate new partnerships, you um, look at new um, actors and new areas as you evolve, but the idea is that you build something together and there is a shared, shared set of principles, of um, agendas, of, um, of interests that, you, that, that allows you to um, to build in these opportunities to collaborate whenever the opportunity arises. I guess the other thing to add to that is, um, firstly, I think if you're really clear on the impact that you're trying to have, then you might invest the time differently. Yeah. So when, when you've all got different impacts that you're aiming for, then it's hard mm. to carve out collaborative time because mm. you're all working to your own audiences and your own agendas. Mm. But if you've really thought about the different impacts that you're trying to achieve collectively, it can create different spaces for using that time differently. And um, when in our first project that we worked on together, we asked, NGOs and academics to give us some assumptions that they had of the other one and one that sticks very strongly in my head was the practitioners saying academics are so slow NGOs are go 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 and that we just we're activists we want to get things done whereas academics stereotypically want to spend time really understanding an issue and theorizing and developing and I think so I think the time is not only about the time commitment to work together but also thinking about the pacing and thinking about how those different cycles of practice interact with each other. And the other thing that came out of the first piece of work we did together was identifying productive tensions. So recognizing that there will be tensions that exist, but how do you move from a tension that could be destructive to one that could be productive and further practice? So I think it's also thinking about how you use the time that you do have together in the best way. Mm -hmm. The final thing that I wanted to say, just going back to the ecological research, is um, that I think shifts some of the nature of time. So mm -hmm. you might have very limited face-to-face -face time because you don't want to travel, you don't want to contribute further negative impact to the environment. So then you need to create 
both uh, trust and relationship building mm -hmm. in a different space, and that takes a different investment of time, but also think about how you use the time that you do have face-to-face -face differently, mm -hmm. and that, that's also shifting in practice. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of more questions, but as time is running, I want to give the, the audience the chance as well to ask their questions. So if you want to, to contribute to the debate, then just let me know or just switch on your microphone and you can ask your questions or you can make your comments. You can also type them in the chat. There was um, the one person before I was talking about, he had to leave, um, he pointed out the 11, um, 11 principles and seven questions for research partnerships from um, a Swiss organization, KFPE. I don't know if everyone is knowing the, um, knows them, but you can find them on the website. So, and take a look at it. I think, yes, okay. Any questions? Yes, there is one. Hi, um, so this question is around research capacity development. And so I just wanted to give a quick answer to that and then Jude might pick up further. I think the first thing to say is that we've been, we started off being quite critical around how capacity development was defined with the GCRF because it seemed to be very much UK based academics going out to the global south and imparting their great knowledge on the global south. Sorry to interrupt, I'm not sure if we have said already what the GCRF is, ah. have you said it before? The GCRF is the UK um, Research Funding for International Development. It's the Global Challenges Research Fund. And <laughs> I think it's £1.6 billion <laughs> of UK overseas development aid is now being invested into, in, in through that specific fund, which is around confronting global challenges. And one of its three, um, three core uh, aims was to build research capacity, but it was quite a uni, uh, a linear one directional research capacity approach. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to put much more emphasis on neutral research capacity as the questioner has, has mentioned. And thinking both about um, that as being capacity exchange, but also about mapping and properly understanding the types of capacity that exist within the countries where global uh, development challenges are being yeah. most strongly experienced. So I think that we've sort of thought about it from a systemic perspective. And then in terms of research capacity development, Christian Aid's own interest is in building practitioners' research capacity to feel, to really enhance the knowledge and confidence of practitioners that you can you are a practitioner but you can also be a researcher and that being a researcher and being a practitioner are not mutually exclusive areas and so building capacity to both build partnerships with academics to specify research questions to think about what you want to get out of research as a process and um seeing seeing and I guess that goes back to the principle that we had about valuing different knowledges and skills as well. So seeing capacity both as doing research, but also that if your research is going to have real impact, it, you need to have different capacities mm -hmm. to enable that to happen. Yeah, we're also um, increasingly working with the Global Development Network, who um, have a program called Doing Research, and that um, involves a series of um, mappings of research capacity in different low-income countries. Um, so they're looking uh, primarily at social science research and the higher education sector, but we're working with them to look at other types of, of research um, and research, not just the um, inputs, research, inputs and, and research processes, but also research communication and how research interacts with policy and, and practice. So um, through some of the, the new projects that we're doing together, we're trying to connect these spaces, the systemic mapping of um, co research capacity systems in the global south to ensure that, um, that, that that capacity is being built on rather than the UK or, or northern academics sort of ideas about what capacity counts and then how that connects to other types of, of research capacity in these different contexts too. Okay, Raphael is answered. I hope so. 
right? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for letting us know. Uh, Kasim Perry, you posted an uh, ad. It was about the Global Challenges Research Fund. Okay, are there any other questions? Anyone who wants to ask? So then I will ask a question instead. We're mostly talking about um, public funded research and governmental funded research right now. Are these principles also meant to be um, implemented in private funding? As I know, UK has a lot of private funding in development research, right? Or not? Um, what, what do you mean by private funding? Do you mean through foundations or through um, private cons Okay. Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. So we haven't worked directly um, with foundations, although we have, I did have a conversation recently about, um, about some of the foundations and the very different kind of agendas and logics they have and, and perhaps in certain areas more flex flexibility around funding. But, um, but it's not an area that we've looked into. And I think, I mean, I, I think your question, the fact that, I don't know about Kate, but I don't feel able to answer your question is again, um, reinstating of the fact that you really have to understand where the funding is coming from, what the um, mechan funding mechanisms are and how that enables you, what that enables you to do um, through collaboration or doesn't. So without knowing all of that, I'd be reluctant to talk. Um, I think that's true, but also the principles I would say are universal about development research that is intended to have real world impact. So we're not saying that these principles are for every piece of research that is done. There'll be lots of research that isn't intended to have, that isn't being funded to have real world impact. But where that research is applied research mm -hmm. is trying to further development thinking and understanding or to have a tangible impact on development then these principles apply. And I think um, generally private institutions, I mean, from an NGO perspective, private institutions will fund NGOs to do research, which could be of varying quality and might have different challenges. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, part of, part of Christian Aid's interest in investing in research is to improve our standards of evidence and recognising that we're not always producing evidence that is really robust and valid. And so speaking from a practitioner perspective and thinking about the types of private fundraising we might do, it would be it's really useful to have those sorts of principles to ensure that we're not only thinking about the practice, but we're also thinking about the academic rigour in our research. Thank you. Um, there was one, I think it was in the paper from you, Kate, uh, as the first author. It was talking about um, good communication. And for me, um, good communication is very, um, in, in a, let's say like that, in an intercultural um, context, good communication can mean anything else to everyone. Um, who defines what good communication is? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. I suppose, well, partly, Good communication and trust go together, don't they? So if, if you're able to build trust through your communication, then you should be able, to, if, if there is trust, then you should be able to communicate. And when there is communication that is maybe not um, responding to your needs or is not clear or is not about the right subjects, if you've got trust, you should be able to challenge it. I'm not sure if that quite answers your yeah. question. But. And maybe to add, I mean, I think we think a lot about audiences and difference so obviously depending on on whether the communication is as Kate's saying about process and about building trust or building a kind of capacity to critically reflect to um, assess where we're going where and um, how we are changing both individually or organizationally or as a as a network um, there's also the need to kind of think about the different audiences and how communication needs will be very different depending on whether you're operating in an academic space or in a practitioner space. I think this, for example, this space, we had a long conversation about who, who are 
who will be these seminar participants? Are they mainly academics? Are they a mixture? Of, is the DSA similar to EAADI? Is there a difference in culture? And, and I think, yeah, there's never a definitive argument, but having these conversations about audience and, and responding accordingly is um, all you can do to respond. I think we have a good mix from um, within our audience. There are practitioners, there are researchers, there is a student. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay, are there any questions from the audience? I don't want to take up all the time from myself. Mm -hmm. There is one. Sorry, we're just reading the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a long question. It's about, it's it's similar to my first question, it's about how there are applicability um, principles and how they can really be ensured that cooperation and collaborative research is fair and equitable. Um, I wonder if it's worth talking through a recent example uh, from Christian Aid. So as an international NGO, we're not eligible to apply for research council funding directly. We don't have research eligibility. Uh, status. So we can only apply for funding um, to support our research if we partner with a UK-based academic organisation. And historically that's been quite challenging for us because it tends to be that the UK-based academic organisation comes to us when they, want to, when they want to reach people living in poverty or comes to us when they want to do a bit of impact work at the end of a project and do some of the communication. And the, often the overall agenda or the, the research question isn't something that we, we are able to shape. Um, over the course of being involved in the Rethinking Research Collaborative, I've also had the privilege to sit on a couple of funding panels as the practitioner, so on a Arts and Humanities Research Council funding panel, and to review the types of proposals that were going through that panel. Because of that, I could then bring back some of the experience of that into Christian Aid. And when the next call came out, we were then in a much better position to think about the type of research we might want to do and to approach academics that might want to join us in that research. So although we then applied for funding through a, with a UK-based academic, um, with a UK-based university, we were able to influence and shape the research question. And then through the process of designing the proposal, we've sort of in, internalised the, principle, the, the principles of fair and equitable partnerships and looked at what that means for the co-creation of the research questions, for thinking about the research design, for thinking about the research um, calls within that design and what type of criteria we might be putting out for the research calls, to think to create space for an, um, analysis that brings mm -hmm. together the different partners and to be really clear about the types of impact that different partners are looking for in that project and to make sure that the funding aligns to the sort of variety of impacts that are important. And so I think um, as a relatively privileged maybe international NGO, because we're quite large, we've been able, to, through being part of this process, we've been able to translate it into practice. We're waiting to see if the project will actually get funded, but we're quite convinced that the development of the project, and if it is funded, will be really reflective of these principles. Okay, Katrina, is your question answered? We have, in fact, we have two articles. The one just recently referred to in the IDS bulletin, um, which is, is open access, and then a new one coming out in a special issue of the Canadian Journal for Development Studies, which looks um, at the principles and gives examples. The second one's a little bit more academic, theoretical. The first one's more from a practitioner's perspective, but it gives quite a lot of examples of how these principles work in, in practice. I mean, one which cuts across quite a few of the principles is just having a, a co-creation phase at the start of a new project, which allows for um, time to map the context, make sure that you're building on existing um, structures within context that you're um, developing a sound participatory governance structure that you're really kind of understanding, go, taking time to understand your different agendas, different interests, and to develop a kind of shared way of working, a shared collaborative culture. 
Um, so, so that is, I think, key, and that's something now when I write my funding proposals, I'll always put in at least a nine-month co-creation phase at the start. Um, some funders like it, some don't, but it's becoming, I think, increasingly recognised as a legitimate part of, of research funding. I think there's still big challenges. So going back to the example I was given, I was giving, we still can't be the principal investigator. The funding mm. still has to go through a UK mm. institution. There are still challenges of bringing together academics and civil society in the global south because of logistical issues such as visas and these sorts of things. So I think there are lots of practical challenges that make it difficult. But the really important thing seems to be to be able to be able to identify people with a shared vision and with the energy to try and make it work and then you can make it work. Okay, any other questions from you audience viewers? Okay, um, then another one from me. Um, how would you define success from your perspective in terms of development research or practice? Um, I think um, going back to the example that I was just giving, so one of the things that was very clear when we started talking about impact was that for the partners that were based in, it's a project that's looking at economic transformation in war economies as they move into peace economies. And what, what does that economic transformation mean for people that have been living in, in context of war economies with an emerging peace? And one of the really important areas of impact for the partners working on the project was that the communities involved in the generating the data to understand those transformations were then the recipients of that data from other communities back to them so that they could have discussions and reform their ideas of what a peace-based economy might look like and use that to, to sort of imagine different futures that maybe had been limiting before. At the same time, the academics involved in the, in the project were interested in contributing to theoretical knowledge and understandings of what economic transformation looks like. And the Christian aid policy staff in the project were interested in influencing national governments to think about their, their economy and how they were investing in their economy. So there are sort of very different needs, if you like, from the different actors. Success for me means designing a process that can address those different needs and that through the process, people feel an ownership they you don't need to participate in everything it doesn't need to look the same for everyone involved but you need to understand how it fits together and why the different aspects are important and feel that there is enough of a shared vision that um it doesn't matter if you're not involved in everything i suppose mm. but that you're committed to the project overall yeah and i guess um the counterpart to that is is success as change in policy funding structures which enable much more equitable collaborations to happen at the moment if funding can't primarily go to those in the global south whether where, whether academics or practitioners then we're only going to get so far so the ultimate success would be probably moving beyond people like me certainly possibly even people like Kate and actually recognizing existing research capacity in the global south which is a mixture of academic research and practice-based research, and then making sure that funding from the North is directed into those centers of excellence with possible space for support in global comparison and a lot of these challenges cross national boundaries. So there will be a role for people like us in, in organizations like ours to some extent, but when, that um, decentralization of research funds happens, then, then we will have success. But unfortunately, we've got some ways to go to achieve that. Okay, thank you. We got another question in the chat box. It's ticking of practicalities. Does, money, does the money going through a university mean that they always manage the process? Do you have examples of any research collaborations managed by other partners, especially in the South? Do you have um, examples? Um, as a non, I'm trying to think as a non-universities or... Non I mean, okay. so there's obviously examples, going back to the question that 
Boris, you asked us about private foundation type mm -hmm. funding. There's obviously examples of that type of research that is managed um, from within a specific country context mm -hmm. and where the agenda has been set by, so again, sorry, I keep talking about Christian aid, but where mm -hmm. one of our country programs has decided to do a piece of work and then they've invited people into that process. So they've raised funds and then they've They've invited either academics locally or academics mm -hmm. from different countries or civil society organizations into a process they're running. There's a good example on our, if you, if someone, if the person answer, asking the question looks up the Rethinking Research Collaborative Materials, there's a really nice uh, case study from Andrea Cornwall mm -hmm. about how in Brazil they, they managed and, and ran, the, ran mm -hmm. the research process. In terms of the big sort of UK-based Global Challenge Fund funding. I don't have a, a specific example there, on that. There are, so there are um, smaller network grants which um, involve, have to involve a principal investigator from um, a country in the Global South, and they don't necessarily have to involve the UK at all. Uh, but they're quite small grants in there specifically for networking purposes. So um, hopefully that's a positive trend in the right direction. And then, um, I mean, in the, the DFID grant that Christian Aid has at the moment, they, that, it, it's based in Christian Aid, but with partners um, from across the three yeah. countries that we're working within. And, and we are brought in, the Open University is brought in as a partner. So that's quite a different governance structure. With, um, with the Arts and Humanities Research Council funding that I was mentioning before, the reason that I'm not sure if it will be successful in getting the funding is that we've put that the research call it's a network fund it's a it's a big grant that has a set of research calls within the grant that are calling for new new research or sort of specifying local research and we've put in the bid with that uh, research criteria and the decision making on those research calls being set in the global south and run by practitioners in discussions with the HLC before we put the bid in, they said that was okay, but it hasn't happened before. So it'll be interesting to see if we do manage to get the funding. <laughs> yes, this is the last chance for a last question mm -hmm. from the mm -hmm. audience as we're coming over an end now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, I think all the first questions are answered. Then looking at the time, we came to an end. Jude, Kate, I thank you very much for your presentation today and for taking your time to, to speak to us and answer all your questions, mine and the one from the audience. Thank you to anyone who joined us today and for giving us your time. The next Diadi webinar will be in about three weeks. The main topic will be about land grabbing and land concentration with Sylvia Kay from the Transnational Institute. I hope we will read and see some of you again have a nice evening or morning or whatever time you, zone you're living in and goodbye from my side thank you everybody thank for you. joining thanks, thanks for listening bye, bye.